Father, thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you for the rain, even though it, it kind of gets in the way at times. But we're grateful, Lord, that you replenish this earth. And now we ask that you would replenish us. Would you rain down your spirit, your word, your truth in this space? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, there are uh, certain questions in life that uh, you, you need to ask people, right? You need to ask people, especially like on a first date, maybe before you go into business with them, questions that have the, the, the ability to reveal someone's true character and identity. Questions like this, uh, what topping is best on the burger? I mean, does that not reveal everything you need to know about somebody? It's like, oh, I could tell your whole story right now based on how you answer that particular question, right? Or how about a question like this, uh, if you could be any Disney character, which one, which one would you be? I mean, that's a game changer, depending on how, how somebody answers that. But you all have it so stinking easy because Disney has the rights to every freaking character right now. So you could choose anybody. Okay, how about this question right here, my favorite. What's your favorite movie? All right, doesn't that say a lot about somebody, the movie that they choose to watch? Uh, we have three girls right now, all under the age of 10. And so the only movies that I get to watch involve purple singing dinosaurs or fairy princesses. Uh, I'm not saying anything bad about that. I'm just saying it's kind of how it is, right? But when I was hip and cool, not if, but when, a long, long time ago, uh, there was a couple of movies that I absolutely loved. I mean, some of my favorites include Braveheart, Gladiator, and Remember the Titans. And if you have never yelled out, freedom, or are you not entertained, or right side, Strong side, right? Okay, a few of us have seen these movies. Thank you, thank you. I did notice yesterday, Bra Braveheart came out in 1995. I am totally aging myself now, but these are some of my, my favorite movies. Here's the thing, though, about my favorite movies, and, and many of yours probably have something similar uh, in common, right? There, there are different characters or, or crises, and I, I get that. There are different settings and special effects, but all of them have one thing in common. All of them powerfully, powerfully speak to our next desire, the desire for devotion. All of them have this one thing in common. If you're joining us today uh, in chapel, we're talking about the seven core longings of the human heart this year, the seven core longings of, he, of your heart. And typically, when it comes to, to these particular desires, uh, beauty, fascination, power, Typically, we think we need to suppress these to be good Christians, or we need to repent of them in order to please God. But the opposite is, in fact, true. The opposite is, in fact, the case where, where God gave us these desires to learn more about him and to be ultimately drawn closer to him. And nowhere is that more true than when it comes to our desire for devotion. So there is something deep in our hearts that, that comes alive when we see or experience true devotion. It could be devotion to the girl, devotion to the team, devotion to the cause, but we're all intrigued by that. Many of us inspired by that, right? When somebody loves and fights and plays with and is so committed to their whole heart where they go all in, they stop at nothing to achieve their dreams. They, they, they overcome these insurmountable odds. From Katniss Everdeen to Michael Jordan to the new lovesick couple in the, in the Nicholas Sparks novel that just came out. I, I, all of them, though, they're so devoted. They're so dedicated. And our hearts come alive when we hear and read and witness stories like that. That's why we watch sports. That's why we go to the movies. That's why we give away awards. Because we love someone who is so devoted to something. That's why my friend actually wore a monkey suit one time. Let me explain. Uh, one day in our ministry back in New Mexico, we were kickstarting a brand new worship at a local college, and we wanted to get the word out. And so I brainstormed with a bunch of my ministry interns the best way to, uh, to spread the word about this new worship opportunity. We said, okay, we'll do some flyers, we'll do some banners, maybe a little social media campaign, we'll give away some free stuff. And, and we left that meeting all feeling pretty good about, about how we were going to get the word out. And then we showed up the next day on campus, and we saw Jason. And Jason was wearing a full, life-size, totally like hairy and actually creepy monkey suit. And he was running around from class to class handing out bananas. And, and eventually we like caught up with monkey boy. We're like, dude, what, what are you doing? This was not part of the plan. Like we said we were going to hand some things out, maybe chalk some designs or whatever. What are you doing? And Jason looked at me straight through the little like monkey beady black eyes, right? And he says, Everybody can do banners. Nobody does bananas. 
And then he ran off and started assaulting people with bananas. It was like, dude, what, what, are, what is happening here? But I learned a profound lesson that day. And the lesson was this. Always ask Jason to be your hype guy. Right? Like that, that was the lesson. But more than that, I learned this. Devotion, true devotion, heartfelt devotion is costly. And it requires you to go further than most people are willing to go and to do more than most people are willing to do. And yet, if you take that risk, if you make that jump, more amazing things can happen than you can even imagine. As I mentioned before, we see devotion in different places. We see it in the world of sports. Jerry Rice, the great 49er receiver, was literally out running ladders and hills the day after they won the Super Bowl because he wanted to be prepared for the next season. He was dedicated to his sport. Or, or take um, Gabby Douglas, right, for as an example. She started gymnastics at the age of three. She demanded that she be homeschooled so she could spend 10 hours a day in the gym. That's devotion, right? That's dedication. We also see devotion and dedication in the arts, right, where actors and actresses, like our own Jessup actors and actresses, spend countless hours memorizing their script and figuring out how to play that part just perfectly. We see it in, in nature, where nature photographers will camp out for days on end just to get that one perfect shot, right? That's devotion. That, that's dedication. And our hearts come alive when we see it. And yet, if, if I'm honest with you, words like devoted and dedicated, they don't typically describe my average day. Words like distracted or disinterested seem more appropriate. Anybody else? Can you relate? I'm not sure if, if those two words are, 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 are good for me. Devoted and dedicated? Let me give you a couple of examples. I quit all of the high school sports that I was playing by the end of my junior year because the coaches or the practices became too demanding. I started college as a biology major because major, I was going to be a dentist because my dentist drove a Ferrari and I wanted to drive a Ferrari. Well, I took intro to cell biology and it was way too hard. So I quit that major and I joined all the athletes in communication. Okay? I barely stay in contact with my closest friends. And if it wasn't for Facebook, I, I literally wouldn't know if anybody's birthday was today or tomorrow or, or, or later this month. That's true of even like my cousins and sometimes my sisters. Okay? I tried to learn to play the guitar multiple times, but as soon as my fingers started hurting and getting all calloused, I gave that up. There are numerous pieces of workout equipment, exercise videos in my home that are, that are unused because I gave up on those. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to eat healthy, but I got two words for you, crispy creams, right? Like I've tried so many things, so many times, I tried to be devoted and dedicated, and yet I'm not. I'm so distracted. I'm so diverted. I could keep going, but hopefully you get the point. And I feel as if I, I look and sound like a big enough loser right now at this point, okay? But chances are you can relate, right? We love the idea of being dedicated and devoted to something, but then in actuality, when it comes to the practice of it, when it comes to living it out, we're just not so good at it, right? We all love the new boyfriend or girlfriend until someone just a little bit more attractive starts showing interest in us. And then we start to question the relationship, we're super excited about the new car, right, until that first door ding or scratch or food spill occurs. Side note, if, if you see me walking around, ask me about the great black bean explosion of 2015 in my wife's minivan. Okay, great story. Later. Okay. Uh, we're all devoted to a certain hobby or major or job or class until they begin too hard, until they start asking for too much of us. We get pretty excited about the team or the cause until the team loses or the cause isn't fresh and new and exciting anymore. Distraction and disinterest describes us doesn't it? Describes our whole world. In fact, distraction is now the, the new default setting in our society. And if you don't agree with me, I want you to just look down at your phone. In fact, many of you in the back already are. That's awesome. Perfect. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. I know that all of you are reading the Bible app, so I totally am with you, okay? Just look at your phone just for a second, okay? If you want to talk about distraction, it's right here. In all seriousness, a recent study about millennials found that on the average, a millennial will touch their smartphone 5,000 times a day. You will be on your phone for an average of five hours a day, and you will engage in what they call over a hundred different sessions a day. When you talk about distraction, it's right here, right? And every beep and ring and ding and notification and vibration, all of it just adds to that distraction that we experience in life. 
The thing is, though, that that distraction, that distracted mentality is moving from our phones into our faith. I want you to think about your relationship to the Lord just for a second. I want you to think about how committed you are to him right now. I imagine that, that many of us are stuck in what I'll call the ritual of religion. We're just kind of going through the motions because that's what, that's what we've always done. Or, or we're doing things like going to church or praying because that's what we're supposed to do as good Christians. I mean, honestly, in, co- in comparison to those numbers, how committed, how dedicated are you to the Lord? Do you offer up 5,000 prayers a day? Are you in the Word five hours a day? Do you engage in a hundred different worship sessions every day? Probably not. And and at some level, you know, last night I was thinking about this, that's probably okay because that's just crazy, isn't it? I mean, come on. To give something that much time, to give something that much attention, to give something that much dedication, to give something that much of myself, 5,000 touches, five hours a day, a hundred sessions, that's ridiculous, isn't it? Who would do that? Hold on one second, right? (laughs) I mean, who, who would do that? Oh, oh, we already are doing that. Because, friends, I need you to understand. You were created to be devoted to something. That's how you've been hardwired. And the world is so interested in, in getting you to be devoted to them because it'll give them a quick buck. It'll make them a quick buck. You are going to be devoted to something. The question is what? Who? It's not a matter of if you're going to be devoted to something. The question is what? What are you going to be devoted to? And I don't know about you, but my heart aches for more. My heart aches for more than this. And I want to be be committed to more than this. I want to be committed and devoted to a cause, to a calling that is worthy of all that time, that is worthy of my best, that deserves my dedication and my devotion. Something that's significant enough for me to say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to give it all for that. I don't want to just play the game, man. I don't want to just go through the motions. I don't want to have my attention or my focus or my energy be so distracted. Like, squirrel, squirrel. It's like, what? I don't want that to be the way that I live life. You all know the term and the acronym FOMO, right? Because you all invented it, right? Your generation came up with it, FOMO. But truth be told, because we are so distracted, because we are so disjointed, Because we are so divided in our affections and in our attentions, I'm here to tell you, you should be afraid because you are missing out. You are so distracted, so diverted, so disjointed, and I'm right there with you. We are not devoting ourselves to what matters the most, and we're missing out. We're missing out on this life that God has prepared for us. We're missing out on this experience of life that God gave to us originally and then died on the cross to to, to give back to us. We're missing out. You were made by a driven, dedicated, devoted God to live a driven, dedicated, devoted life. You were created by a driven, dedicated, devoted God to live a driven, dedicated, devoted life. I love the way Pastor Mike Bickle says it. Half-heartedness diminishes our glory as human beings who have been made in the image of God. When you do something halfway, you are actually diminishing the God-likeness that is in you. You were not created to do anything halfway. Half-heartedness in any area of life, but especially when it comes to your faith, is so bad. It's hurting us so badly. You've been created for more. You've been called to give more. This past week, this, this passage of Scripture just hit me across the face. It's Psalm 27.4. This is the Passion Translation. Here's the one thing I crave from God, says David. The one thing I seek above all else. Man, I want the privilege of living with God every moment in his house. Finding the sweet loveliness of his face, filled with awe, delighting in his glory and his grace. I want to live my life so close to him that he takes pleasure in my every prayer. Isn't that a great verse? Isn't that a great cry of the heart? But is that your cry of the heart? God, I don't want anything else in this life except for you. I just want one thing, one thing I desire, to see you, to be with you, to spend time with you, to be so connected with you that every breath is like a worship song. That every breath is like a prayer that I'm offering to you. I want to be so devoted to you, God. Until that's the cry of our heart, my friends, 
we're going to be missing out. That's how this life is supposed to be done. It's exactly what Matthew said. Right? He's quoting Jesus. He says this, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. I wish I could say that Jesus was exaggerating here just like, to like make a point. Or he was trying to like get aroused out of the crowd like, ha, 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 everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now he can tell us the truth. He meant what he said and he said what he meant. He wants God to be your magnificent obsession. He wants God to be this thing that you are so preoccupied with that you can't even think straight about anything else. He wants you to default to loving, serving, praying, worshiping, honoring, glorifying the Father. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, I want you to be so dedicated to the Lord, more dedicated than you are to this. I want you to give God 5,000 touches, five hours, 100 sessions. Maybe that would be the Thomas translation of Matthew 22. I want you to give God all of it. But why would God say that? Right? Why would he say all of it? I mean, is he, is he insecure? Does he need us to, to give him all of that? Because he's like, I don't know if anybody really loves me or likes me. Right? Is God like a words of affirmation kind of God where that's his love language? Is, is he bored? Is he, is he looking for, for some more grades in the assignment book or assignments in the grade book, however you're going to say it, right? Like, oh, man, the end of the semester is coming up. You guys better get busy, right? I mean, why would God say, give me all of you? Why would he say that? His insistence on our devotion to him, on our wholehearted devotion to him, is for our benefit, not his benefit. He doesn't need us to be wholeheartedly devoted to him. But we, to live life fully, to live life abundantly, we need to be wholeheartedly devoted to him. Are you with me? You might think that a passionate desire for God is our gift to him. Here you go, God. I'm, I'm giving this to you. He was like, no, 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 a passionate life devoted to me is his gift to me because that's how I experience life. That's how I experience this thing called life. That's how I find myself. That's how I become the best version of myself is when I'm devoted to the Lord. It's weird how this happens, my friends, but it does. As I begin to develop more passion, more devotion, more dedication to God, as I truly seek him first and give him my all, it's amazing how I start to develop more passion and interest and devotion to other things in life. But God has to, become, has to come first. You with me? It's weird, but as, as I begin to love God more, I begin to fall more in love with my wife. As I begin to love God more, I begin to have more patience for my friends and my roommates. As I begin to love God more, I fall more in love with snowboarding and golf and food. Like, I always love food, right? I always, but with God, it's just so much better, right? As I begin to love God more, put him first, give him my all, everything else starts to fall in place. But the opposite is not true. If you reverse the battery, there won't be any power. If you devote yourself to anything above God, it will suck the life away from you. It will suck your energy and attention to where you can't be devoted to other things in your life. You with me? When you're obsessed with God... He says, now I'm going to give you back everything else. But if you make anything else your obsession, it starts to take and take and take. You have no time for anything else. That that's where most of us are right now. Here's the thing, though. The only way that I think we can grow in our devotion to the Lord is to just be so enamored and overwhelmed by his devotion to us. I don't want you to walk out of here this morning and be like, okay, I'm going to be more, more devoted, more committed. I'm going to be like, here we go. Let's work hard and, and make this happen. It'll work until about like 1045, and then you'll be done. In order to be more devoted to the Lord, more committed, more dedicated, you've got to focus on how dedicated he is to you. You've got to focus on the fact that he has given all of himself to you. And that will then compel you to want to give all of yourself to him. Because th this book is full of, of stories and examples of, of a God who is so devoted, right? Whose devotion never wavers, whose passion never weans, whose, whose dedication is never in question or never in doubt. Even when his people do the dumbest of things, God is always right there giving his all, giving his best. 
And that's especially true when it comes to the Christmas narrative. I'm not sure we understand how profound this moment really is. I don't think we will ever grasp the enormity of what happened in this little stable behind the inn. I mean, this is, this is the epitome of devotion, my friends. The God who lives in the highest heavens moves to the earth. The God who is infinite becomes an infant. The God who spoke the Milky Way into existence needs to be, sta- be sustained by his mother's milk. Why would you do that? Why would you lower yourself, humble yourself, make a fool of yourself? like that because you're so dedicated because you're so devoted to the cause to the people right you don't sacrifice yourself like that if you're not totally dedicated to the people and the process Jesus in the manger is the greatest expression of devotion this world has ever seen that is so beneath our God that is so beneath a God who is holy and majestic to be born in a manger Why would you do that, God? I just want you to stop and think about it just just for a second. Why would God come to the earth in that way? Because if you stop and think about it, it was really messy. It was just a really messy process, right? Mary is engaged to Joseph, and there's the whole, like, oh, no, I'm pregnant by another man, but there wasn't another man. Like, huh? That's really messy, right, especially in the first century. It's really messy. This young couple has to walk for days, if not weeks, on this gross, dirty road to get to Bethlehem because the ruler demanded they go there. That would be really messy. Nine months pregnant? You kidding me? It's really messy that dirty, grimy, no good shepherds are the only ones who showed up at the baby shower. Like, for real? And to top it all off, Mary had to literally give birth in this grimy, old, dirty stable. Ladies, ladies, just think about this for a second. Imagine being in labor and having to stare at this the whole time. I mean, are you, are you kidding me? Like, this whole thing is so messy. Why would God come to the earth in such a messy way? Hear me out. Because he's not afraid of your mess. He's not afraid of your mess. God does not run from your mess. He doesn't try to like walk away and and, and like, oh, I I didn't see that thing, right? No, he is so committed to you, so dedicated to you that he enters into your mess so he can save you from your mess. I mean, it hit me just the other night. Last night I'm driving home, kind of praying through this whole message, and the Lord's like, Thomas, think about the word Messiah. (laughs) What's at the beginning of it? mess because that's what he saves us from and so he comes to the earth in this really messy way because he's not he's not turned off by that he's not mad at you because of that he's not distant and aloof because of your mess he's right there in the middle of it that's devotion that's dedication and if God would go that far for you if he would lower himself to that level there is nothing in this earth that he would not do for you he's dedicated to you he's devoted to you I want you to be so Excuse me, so overwhelmed by that. I'm going to invite the worship band to come up. We're going to enter into a time of worship. I just want to close with these questions. Guys, God doesn't hold anything back. Life as a whole, but especially life in Christ, is not meant to be done halfway. God does not hold anything back from you. So here's the question. Why are you holding so much back from him? Why are you holding back? He doesn't hold back to you. He gives everything. So why aren't you giving everything back to him? So this Christmas season, as we come back next semester and talk more about devotion and and dedication, I just want you to look at the manger. I want you to look at the cross. And I want you to believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is totally and forever dedicated and devoted to you. And then I want you to ask yourself, am I totally and forever dedicated to him? Because that's when my heart will truly come alive. And that's when the promise of Psalm 37, 4 will come into fruition, right? Where he will grant us the desires of our heart. When we delight ourselves, when we dedicate ourselves to him. Let me pray that over you and I'd love for you to join me in worship. Father, thank you is so pathetic when it comes to to trying to express our gratitude for what you have done for us, to the devotion and dedication you have shown to us over the years. 
From Adam and Eve to Abraham to Moses to David to all the disciples, Lord, to our parents, to us, Lord, we make a mess of this story. And yet here you are entering into that mess as the Messiah to save us from it. Thank you, God, for coming close. Thank you for coming to us. Thank you for being so dedicated, so devoted. And now in turn, God, would you stir our hearts? Would you open our eyes and our minds? Would you compel us to be more dedicated and devoted to you? Lord, that's the key to this life is you. And so help us, God. Help us now to turn our affections and attention to you. Make it so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.